stock market is always extremely buoyant heading into a recession. You know, what we find is that the median return of the S&P 500 in the year leading up to that peak is plus 16%. Wow. An, yeah, plus 16% with an interquartile range of 14 to 20. Now, plus 16% is like more than double the mean or the median return of the equity market on a yearly basis, the annual return right. of the equity market since the, since the, um, the turn of the century. Or not turn, turn so, of the previous So, so basically the, the party gets really good right before the cops show up is what you're saying. And, and and I mean real good right before the cops show up. I mean, there's some stuff going on upstairs, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and so like the, if you look at this plus 16% median return, again, in a quartile range of 14 to 20, half of that median return comes in the final three months uh, leading up to a recession. Final three months. Like, well, it, it wait, just, wait, 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 wait. So, so, so 9%, meaning over 50% of that 16% return yes. happens right at the end. Yes, exactly. Okay, wow. <laughs> so the market not only is, is very, boy, boy, like basically you get twice as much return you typically get in the equity market in the year leading up to recession. And more than half of that twice as much return comes in the final three months. <laughs> Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst and market researcher Darius Dale. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Darius, in which he explains why stocks are likely to go on one last surge before recession hits in the first half of 2024, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Darius Dale. Let, let's try to bring it down to kind of the next, let's say six months, 12 months, whatever, um, maybe six months uh, more, more so. And people who are saying, okay, look, um, you know, Darius is saying that, uh, you know, looks like things are going to hold together for the near term here, uh, but there's a recession lurking out there on the horizon. Maybe now it's going to hit more in the sort of April 2024 type range. Um, as I'm looking at different types of strategies or assets to consider, you know, Darius, what, what are some of the things at 42 Macro that you guys have your eyes most closely on here? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start by saying kind of our general take on on, on the market. And I'll use the stock market as, the, as kind of the, the, the lowest hanging fruit here. Um, I still think there's right tail risk to price in in, in the equity market. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason we say that is because what we found is, um, you know, again, remember I made the call, we made the call in May, early May, right after we recorded it. In early May, we, you know, we did this research and said, hey, look, I think the stock market's going to run away from bears to the upside. And I think the bond market's going to run away from bears to the downside in price. Um, obviously, again, both of those calls are extremely right. You get about 1,800 basis points of, of performance um, just out of that uh, relationship alone. But yeah, going very, back- Very good call at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th this is the point I'm making. Going back to, you didn't have to pivot bullish in mid-January when we did. You could have easily just pivoted bullish in mid-May and actually saved and salvaged your year if you were doing the proper research at the proper time. And this is why folks pay for research. You know, I'm not saying people need to pay for my research. I think you should just go find whoever is good at producing research and add them to your investment toolkit. But we obviously appreciate those who check out uh, 42 Macro. But getting back to this, um, getting back to this, uh, to this discussion, what we've discovered in that in that time frame, which you know helped us make that call, which is the stock market is always extremely buoyant heading into a recession. You know, what we find is that the median return of the S&P 500 in the year leading up to that peak is plus 16%. Wow. An, yeah, plus 16% with an interquartile range of 14 to 20. Now, plus 16% is like more than double the mean or the median return of the equity market on a yearly basis, the annual return right. of the equity market since the, since the, um, the turn of the century, or not turn, turn so, of the previous So, so basically, the, the party gets really good right before the cops show up, is what you're saying. And, and and I mean, real good right before the cops show up. I mean, there's some stuff going on upstairs, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and so, like, the, if you look at this plus 16% median return, again, in a quartile range of 14 to 20, half of that median return comes in the final three months uh, leading up to a recession. Final three months. Like, well, it, it wait, just, wait, 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 wait. So 9% so, so meaning over 50% of that 16% return yes. happens right at the end. Yes, exactly. Okay, wow. <laughs> so the market not only is, is very, boy, boy, like basically you get twice as much return you typically get in the equity market in the year leading up to recession. And more than half of that twice as much return comes in the final three months. And okay. so if we're talking about a recession that could start in, let's say, the second half of our forecast horizon, which, by the way, we've maintained that forecast horizon since since November of 2022, hasn't changed. 
If it comes in the second half of that six month interval, you're talking about a market that could easily run away from folks uh, into year end. And the reason why I think that's a very legitimate risk in this particular business cycle uh, is because we have not seen Wall Street miss a rally to this degree ever. Um, this was just the, at least at least in terms of recorded data. So uh, what wow, I'm showing- Wow, really? Really, never, this is the most missed rally. rally. At least according to this particular statistic, uh, we have other statistics that might confirm that to, to, to a lesser degree, but this is one statistic that is potentially confirming that. Um, and so what we're showing here is- um, the uh, S&P 500 in the red line, the blue line in this chart shows their year-end uh, S&P 500 target. And what we're showing here is the spread between their, their um, red line and their year-end S&P 500 target. Obviously, there's some, some heteroscedacity in this, in this relationship, so ignore the level. But just in terms of the intergram, the, the amount of time that we spent with the market being above the year-end target, is we've never seen this ever in the history of the time series. You know, it's about been about like seven months thus far. The long, the previous long was, I want to say, in um, the middle of 2020 when the market was rallying prior to the vaccine news. Um, we the market, you know, spent about five months ahead of the um, ahead of the year in uh, forecast. So, you know, and then you get the vaccine news. You see it in the chart here that the year in forecast pops up on the vaccine news. So we have not seen Wall Street broadly sort of miss a rally to this degree before, at least going back to, to the 1999, which is far back as we get this data. We also know that the positioning cycle was very, very, um, you know, very, very, uh, what would I say, very, very light uh, throughout the year. Uh, one thing I'll show you here uh, in terms of uh, the positioning cycle is the uh, one thing we track is aggregated um, a non-commercial net length as a percent of total open interest across all the major asset classes. And what we find is that, you know, U.S. equities, which are currently in the 29th percentile of their longer term time series, which is data, if you go back to the S&P futures, NASDAQ futures and options, et cetera, Russell 2000, Dow, you know, mid caps, we aggregate all that stuff. And I think as far back as the data goes is around 1995 or 1998, we're in the 29th percentile now, after people have capitulated to the upside. We were tracking in the 10th, the 13th percentile the entire time. The market, the the hmm. the. The buy side, you know, the the you know, not, the speculators have been net short this market, and they continue to be because that 29th percentile reading is actually still net short. They've been net short this market the entire year. Wow, painful, so painful. So yeah, so the point we're making is that even though we have this recession view in terms of November to April is when it might start, when you know you're not going to get the red bar until you know year after that. When it, you know, if we even though we have this view where the market's probably going to crash at some point in the first half of next year, I still think there's right tail risk to price in to the upside in the equity market here uh, throughout the year. Uh, and in so much that I still think there's downside to price in uh, in, in the fixed income markets. Uh, one thing we wrap up in terms of wrapping up this um, this, this particular discussion on the in the near-term market yeah. outlook. And, and as you're finding that, let me, let me just, again, just overemphasize, you know, beat, beat this analogy to death. But it sounds like what you're saying is, is um, uh, you know, the, the party gets at its best uh, right before the cops show up. But it sounds like, you know, the, the, here yet. The, 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 the cocaine and strippers come out as the cops are pulling up into the driveway, right? It's like right there at the end where it just goes bananas, right? And you're basically saying we haven't seen that that happen yet, right? Um, and, and to your point that maybe, you know, a lot of the folks at the party have been leaning against the wall as a wallflower, you know, for most of the party and are now getting to the point where they're like, well, screw this, I'm going to have some fun, right? So we have that kind of rager element to the party potentially ahead of us if history is any guide. Yes, uh, your words, not mine, but uh, yeah, yep, that's yep, yep. fantastic. I'll, I'll, I'll own those. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're blameless. <laughs> yeah, fa fantastic analogy. I, I can't, uh, I, could, I couldn't come up with a better analogy myself. So with respect to the equity <laughs> market, that is spot on. We still think the cops haven't gotten there and the wallflowers are, you know, they're looking around going, I've been standing on this wall for a while. I might need to get off the wall. Uh, in terms of, um, in terms of the bond market, we still think there's a decent amount of volatility to price into the bond market. We talked about why there's going to be longer term uh, volatility in the bond market, why we think we're in a secular bond bear market that could get very ugly before the Fed is forced to change its policy in, in both regulatory in terms of commercial banks, but also explicit policy in terms of yield curve control. We think that both of those things are coming at some point in this decade. But in terms of the cyclical outlook for bonds, like the next few months, the medium term, I still think we have this negative, this real scary thing uh, that we need to, uh, to be concerned about, which is the evolution of Japanese monetary policy. Uh, we saw the kind of, you know, the the, the vol market volatility that we, you know, we experienced in back in uh, June and July, uh, July in particular, July and August, with respect to uh, the change in the yield curve control. And we think they're going to continue to have pressure uh, to change yield curve control. And here's why. Japan 
this is the top 10 economies in the world economy across all major statistics, growth, inflation, policy. And then we use those informations to construct systematic trade ideas. As you know, every time we say something about the market, it's generally systematic uh, in terms of what we what should actually be doing with your money. Japan is the only major economy of the top 10 economies in the world and the world economy itself that has above trend, not uh, real GDP growth. So that's a 0 0.6 sigma relative to Australian 10 year mean. We have an above trend composite PMI reading. We have an above trend headline inflation rate, and we have an above trend core CPI rate. It's the only major economy in the world with that particular condition right now. And yet it's the only central bank that really hasn't tightened monetary policy. And yet its currency continues to depreciate day after day after day, week after week after week. And now you have $95 Brent crude oil to deal with in terms of you know the, the negative real wage growth that Japanese consumers have been mired in for almost 18 months now. So in our view, the pressure on the Bank of Japan to eventually do an about face pivot on yield curve control and really materially revising that is actually quite high heading into the fall in the context of everything we started the conversation about, Adam, about you know the transition from immaculate disinflation to sticky inflation here in the US, you layer on the, the volatility we could potentially experience out of the Bank of Japan uh, in the fall as well. And I think we are probably got, you know, we're due for like one more squeeze up in stocks. Uh, maybe to the, to the final highs that we experienced prior to the recession, and we're due for one more leg down uh, in bonds uh, that we might experience prior to you can actually start really getting long bonds in, in terms of putting on the recession playbook. So that's our baseline view. You know, we're going to be very Bayesian. All these tables, everything you see in this process uh, gets refreshed day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month in our daily morning note, our weekly webcast and our monthly webcast. And if something changes, we're going to be very loud about changing that to our clients. But unfortunately, you're going to have to be a paying subscriber to get that, that information. Got it. Got it. All right. So um, again, you anticipated my next question, which is sort of, okay, how much more room to run do you think we have in these, these areas? Sounds like you're saying in stocks, we could get back up to kind of previous highs. Um, we, we have some people out there beating the drum of a, of a massive melt up, right? Like, like 6,000 S&P and whatnot. Um, I, I don't get the sense that you're, you're expecting something is super dramatic like that. Um, and on the uh, on the bond side, I uh, won't hold you to this, but just kind of like what wouldn't surprise you to see on the tenure as a yield? Uh, if do we get the worst possible outcome from the perspective of the Bank of Japan? Uh, four seventy five five. Okay. We just keep more tinkering from the Bank of Japan. Four fifty seems very reasonable. Four fifty seems very four fifty to four seventy five with just moderate tinkering in the bank in terms of the Bank of Japan and just you know the, the transition from stick immaculate to sticky inflation. If we get a very you know shocking transition from immaculate to sticky inflation, and then ultimately the Bank of Japan comes out and shocks because let's say Brent crude oil is instead of ninety five dollars, it's one hundred and ten dollars. Then we're talking about four seventy five to five percent on the ten year. I think that's very reasonable in the context of what we talked about in terms of term premia and inflation expectations. Why not? <laughs> like why, why, why? You know, folks thought it was unreasonable for the Fed funds rate to get to five fifty a year ago. Or not maybe not a year ago, but eighteen months ago they thought it was unreasonable. And guess what? The economy evolves, data changes. You have to be Bayesian throughout to make sure that you're constantly putting yourself, giving yourself the best opportunity to be successful in these markets. Okay. All right. So um, let's say that happens, right? And and you've given us lots of reasons to suggest that that, that definitely within the realm of, of possibility, if not probability. Um, we got a 4.75% uh, 10-year yield. Um, we got a lot of indicators saying that a recession's coming. I guess first question is, is, what do you think is more likely that the recession just sort of arrives based upon kind of business as usual, um, or does something really break? Right, that's what a lot of people have. A lot of people have been worried about that when the ten year was below three percent. <laughs> um, yeah. You know that that it, at least when the Fed funds rate was below three percent, they were just like the Fed's not going to be able to get much higher than three because something's going to break. Well, here we are, you know, five and a quarter. Um, so. Uh, what what is more likely here? Do you think that again the the organic arrival of recession, or is it more likely that we really have some new crisis because the economy just really starts stumbling under this high cost of debt? Excellent, excellent question. Uh, and from my perspective, what I think is more likely is the economy just devolves into a recession. Okay. When you have these mundane business cycle processes where corporations can't make money, so they got it, the only lever they have left. You know, they they're going to run out of pricing power eventually. 
because ultimately we know that the consumer is going to get incrementally constricted in terms of its ability to to finance um to finance consumption one we know that income and total you know aggregate income growth is slowing it's albeit it's still you know kind of at a slightly above trend pace but as we move forward in time you know we went from a way above trend pace in income growth to a slightly above trend pace and if you just roll the clock forward one to two more quarters we could be below trend in terms of um income growth and this has been an income driven cycle this has not been a credit driven cycle in fact i got one chart to show on that uh, it's probably got to find it first but this has been a very much an income driven cycle and so as we start to constrict incomes through the lens of you know things like commodity prices through the lens of interest rates um you know that could be um that be something that can obviously you know really push us into a recession but again this is not going to be your granddaddy's big gfc type recession you know we know that's not that's very unlikely um, and the reason we say that is because we have limited credit cycle vulnerabilities um, that I'm in this particular business cycle. You know, what I'm showing in this chart is shows uh, the private sector uh, uh, credit to GDP ratio. Uh, it's at, you know, 152 percent, but it's been declining throughout this business cycle and really hasn't gone anywhere really for the past, you know, kind of 15 years. And so we now have a negative Z score of minus 0 0.7 in, on a terms of trailing five year basis, which is very anomalous heading into a potential recession, which tells you the recession is probably going to be very light. Because typically mm -hmm. what happens in a recession is you get the confluence of adverse selection and capital misallocation because you grew credit too fast. You start extending credit to less credit worthy borrowers towards the end of the business cycle. And then you get some tightening of monetary policy or fiscal policy or both that causes you know that, that pain to really come home to roost. And we're getting the tightening of policy. You look at the five-year Z-score, the debt service ratio, but it just not it's not lining up with the capital misallocation story. So to me, this is more of an income story. And the income story is going to come from corporations looking out into the future saying, I can't make money with this type of cost structure and this kind of productivity growth, right? Remember that chart we showed in terms of productivity yep. growth, less um, wages, less productivity growth relative to inflation. And they're going to say, I got to get rid of some labor because I can't continue to push costs uh, onto consumers without losing market share. And that's something that, again, I have no idea how to say what's when that's precisely going to happen, but we do have a great idea of what to look for in real time in terms of some of the leading indicators that give us an opportunity to say, hey, look, I think it might actually be starting to happen. So let's be booking gains and getting to the sidelines. And ultimately, going back to that global macro risk matrix process that we talked about, the market is going to be somewhat forward looking, not very forward looking, as we talked about with our, our house party analogy, but it's going to be somewhat forward looking. You're going to see some flashes of, of cop sirens, you know, you know, out of the window, <laughs> you're going to hear the cop sirens, you know, coming down the block. And so that global macro risk matrix will transition to a risk off regime ahead of this process. Might not be at the top of the high of the market, but if you sell the market down, I don't know, three, four, five percent from the high, and it ultimately goes on to crash 24, 25 percent, which, which is the median uh, decline, decline that you typically see in recession, then you did a good job of managing risk. And that's all we're trying to do here is consistently stack good results, good process, and you know, ultimately good good outcomes for ourselves and our families. Okay. So for for stocks, yes, you you the strategy is sidestep the the decline that you typically see in recessions. For bonds, there are a lot of people that are saying, God, bonds are a great buy right now be, with, given this outlook because you're getting paid uh, historically high yield, at least you know past 20 years, high yield to be in these instruments. They're very low risk. And if what you say may happen and the Fed, well, we go into recession, presumably we haven't talked about this, but presumably the Fed will then step in uh, to try to start reducing, uh, you know, cutting rates and, and maybe stimulating again, who knows. But basically, if you're expecting rates to come down, well, then you get the price appreciation in the bond as well. So mm -hmm. uh, is, that a, is that a strategy that you guys are looking at? Yeah. So again, we, we all of our investment recommendations come through the lens of our systematic KISS portfolio construction process. My assumption is that by the time we get to that point in the process, the process will start to allocate systematically towards bonds and gross up exposure to bonds once the volatility adjusted momentum signals for those securities change. You know, we can yeah. spend a whole hour talking about how that process works, but that's the general right. gist of it. It's, and it's, I think we did a little bit. So folks, if you're interested yeah. in understanding how that model works, go go look at the previous uh, interview that, that Darius and I did in this channel. Um, but so to your point there, Darius, because I think I remember you saying this, you're like, what's great about the model is it doesn't really matter what I, Darius, you know, Dale, think when I wake up in the morning. The model is actually going to tell us when it's time to start, you know, really beginning to think about making decisions around making these allocations. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, absolutely. And and so, uh, just just a quick just a quick summary of like how that process is going to work systematically. Right now, we are in a Goldilocks regime. Goldilocks is where growth is accelerating on a trend basis and inflation is decelerating on a trend basis. We so we allocate based on Goldilocks, and you don't want to be long 
treasury bonds and Goldilocks. You want to be long, you know, uh, riskier instruments um, in terms of, uh, you want to be long spread products in the fixed income market, high yield, high grade credit, bank loans, leverage loans, you know, stuff like that. So that's what the model is currently long. If this arrow starts inflecting down, then it will take us to a deflation regime. That's when you do actually want to get long, you know, treasury bonds, you know, uh, mortgage backed securities and things like that, investment grade credit, anything that has duration in the, in the, um, in the treasury bond space. But again, we, that's, that's going to be, that's going to tell us what to want from a factor exposure perspective, it's not going to tell us how much of the factor exposure we should actually be long. That process comes through our bottom-up risk management overlay. This is our top-down risk management overlay. And again, that's through our uh, uh, volatility adjusted momentum signal. If you know the model says we need to be long TLT, but TLT is bearish, we'll have a 0% position to it. If TLT is neutral, we'll have a 5% position to it. If it's, if it's bullish, we'll have a 10% position to it. So again, it's a multi-step, multi-factor process that's ultimately designed to help us kind of chop off the left tail of the return distribution by not being long things that are breaking down and are exhibiting, um, you know, kind of dangerous volatility characteristics because typically volatility is a leading indicator for big changes in price. So that, that's how that process works. Again, it's very sophisticated, very wonky, but, you know, again, it's that's that's how we help, you know, thousands of investors worldwide kind of manage, uh, you know, really outperform the market. You know, I could probably say that we have done that uh, for the last couple of years, uh, really since we started the firm. Uh, just uh, answer your question on bonds specifically. Um, you, so bonds are a great asset class when you're heading into recession. And right now, there's a big di divergence between what the Fed is effectively forecasting they're going to do on interest rate policy, which is cut 312, 313 basis points between their terminal Fed funds rate and what they think is their kind of longer run neutral estimate rate. And so they think that number is 2.5% still. That may change tomorrow in terms of the FOMC. I doubt it's going to change uh, based on you know what Fed Powell said in, in uh, at Jackson Hole. So the Fed thinks over the you know, between now and the end of their cutting cycle, whenever that may commence and however long it may take, they're going to cut about 312 basis points. Well, the market's only pricing in about 168 basis points, so roughly about half of that. And so there is money to be made on the long side of bonds when the market starts to get concerned about the recession playbook and it's starting to push the Fed to actually start to flex its balance sheet and flex its um its, its policy rate setting. But we are, in my opinion, a long way away from there in terms of just time and price. And so I'm I'm very concerned uh, that we might see, again, another leg down to fixed income, right. another, another leg higher in stocks before this, this movie is over. Okay, so so you are you are, you are not piling into this trade yet, obviously. No, no, no. Very much would be. I wouldn't. <laughs> we we told people to pile out of it in early May. <laughs> it's been the right call. The bonds yeah. are down ten percent. And so you're yeah. you're staying out until you see whether yeah. this further down leg happens or not. Yeah. Um, all right, God, Darius, I could I could do this all day long, brother. Um, this is this is such a such a great guy to to delve into all this data with. Um, Okay, so we 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 talked sort of high level about stocks and bonds, uh, both in the long term, long long term, next fifteen years, and also in the relatively short near term until potentially recession arrives. Um, uh, I want to talk about two assets. One you've mentioned, one you haven't mentioned. Um, you mentioned in in your long fifteen year fourth turning arc uh, that owning Bitcoin, you know, looks good. Um, I think when we ended last time, I said, "Hey, I was going to let you talk about Bitcoin, and we just didn't have any time to do it." So, um, if you could, if you could talk about your general thoughts on Bitcoin, why you think it's a good thing to be in for the long fourth turning haul, and then if you've got any particular, you know, outlook, shorter term outlook to map to what you just told us with stocks and bonds in terms of how you think Bitcoin is going to perform, um, would love to hear any or all of those. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Adam. So um, just in terms of our, our general thoughts on Bitcoin, it's probably going to struggle because we're not going to have the liquidity conditions that support Bitcoin between now and let's call it the other side of recession, at which point Bitcoin could easily get cut. You know, <laughs> Bitcoin could go down a lot in price. Um, you know, prior to, um, you know, prior to, um, you know, getting to its ultimate lows in a recession, right? Stocks go down 24% on a median basis in recession. Bitcoin's going to go down something that looks like double that, if not more than that. Um, Bitcoin, we also have this negative trend in our global liquidity proxy. So what this, uh, what this model is, is the aggregated sum of the global central bank balance sheet plus global borrowed money supply plus global FX reserves minus gold. And that's what you can see is that this model is extremely co-integrated with, with asset markets. It's not always perfectly correlated with asset markets, although the correlation you know, is typically tight. 
you know, particularly in small, you know, small intervals. But we know that this, this line is likely to continue uh, headed lower over the medium term and may actually accelerate to the downside uh, in a recession because you're going to be losing the private sector liquidity creation components of that of that model of the, of, in terms of um, you're going to be losing the private sector liquidity uh, at the margins in terms of what, what could happen in a recession. While in a recession where we're starting with the starting point of above trend inflation, sticky inflation, recall, if we start with sticky inflation, the public sector liquidity uh, components are going to be an issue as well. So right. Bitcoin is probably not going to do very well between now and let's say the end of whatever recession we may have, assuming that our forecast for a run to start, you know, most likely in the first half of next year, uh, or sorry, you know, first first quarter, you know, first, you know, let's call it by spring of next year is um, is kind of the, the key headline on that. I don't know that Bitcoin is going to do particularly well. We have the halving. So we know the halving is, is quite positive for Bitcoin. We know the Fed's going to eventually pivot, most likely at some point in the middle or the second half of next year. And that's how you're going to get to an extremely explosive move uh, higher in Bitcoin in the back half of the year. But right now, it's the back half of this year. We are not in the back half of next year. So you know, if you're going to be long Bitcoin throughout that entire process, you need to be managing risk in terms of your dynamic position sizing. When Bitcoin's bullish from the perspective of our volatility adjustment momentum signal, you can have that full position size on. When it's neutral, you can cut that position size in half. And this is what our clients do. This is what we tell our clients to do and why they've made a lot of money trading Bitcoin and, and Ethereum um, over the last couple of years. And when it's bearish, you don't have any position on. And right now, Bitcoin and Ethereum are both bearish. And um, and so we don't have any position there, despite kind of you know, currently being in that Goldilocks uh, regime. That's the bottom up overlay uh, versus management overlay kicking in. When we think about the longer term outlook for Bitcoin in terms of the Zimbabwecation of America, the Turkish, <laughs> you know, America turning into Turkey or Venezuela from an equity market perspective and, and, and you know, kind of a financial asset standpoint, I think you still have to go through the path of perdition first. We're not going to get 1 million Bitcoin and 10,000 S&P without first having the Fed panic as a response to what's happening in the fit sovereign debt market, very similar mm -hmm. to what we saw uh, in, in, in the fall of 2022. So I think, you know, for the markets, the Fed will panic and, and give us yield curve control. And the Fed will panic and give us all the financial repression it thinks we need to capitalize this, you know, the kind of asymptotic rise that we're going to see in, in public debt uh, over the next decade or so. But they're not going to do that out of nowhere. You know, I, I use this analogy. Maybe I, we may use this analogy last time we talked. But have you ever seen, Adam? A firefighter get in a fire truck, turn the sirens on, and, and and go put out a fire without there being a fire to put out. No, I haven't either. So, <laughs> I mean, and I made the mistake of saying we're combined hundred in the last podcast, but we're probably a combined eighty. You know, <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest. Here. But it's neither here nor there. But in eighty years of both of us being alive, viewer, we've never seen a central banker panic for no reason. They don't get in that fire truck and, and take that hose out and spray the burning house down unless there's a burning house to spray down. And so ultimately, you're not going to get, you know, to the to the to the rainbows and puppy dog outcome of asymptotic Bitcoin, asymptotic S&P until we actually have the big problem in the sovereign debt market that actually causes the Fed to capitulate on its two percent inflation target that causes the Fed to capitulate on, you know, not having yield curve control and instituting yield curve control and ultimately instituting some severe forms of financial repression, a la what we saw in the 1940s in the previous fourth turning. OK, um, yeah, makes uh, makes great and total sense. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, it sounds like you're saying Bitcoin. Uh, no real compelling reasons to be loading up on it right now. Um, maybe some very compelling reasons uh, to own it once the Fed like completely capitulates with, you know, it goes into full blown rescue mode. But you're saying don't get too far out ahead of that, uh, because if you do, Bitcoin and, and obviously many other risk assets uh, are going to get probably hammered in that path to perdition that you talked about, right? Within the pain that we're going to have to take before the Fed, you know, decides to put on its fireman hat and and, and ride to the, the the ultimate rescue there. Um, okay, I'm glad you brought up that chart that you had there that was liquidity driven because, and I've forgotten to mention to ask you this when we talked last time, this was actually a bell that you were ringing uh, was that liquidity was drying up, and we went through a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, we don't need to spend a ton of time on it, but you you it sounds like what you said is is it, what I took from the, that chart there is you still have those same concerns that yep. liquidity on on a net basis is is declining and you could you could see some catalysts that could force it to dry up pretty substantially. Yeah, absolutely. So um let's this is kind of give you a, quick, a few quick slides on liquidity before we wrap up. 
So liquidity is, is driven by counter-cyclical and pro-cyclical factors. There's private sector creates liquidity and central banks and finance ministries uh, create liquidity. We know that the, the public sector, particularly central banks, have seen decline liquidity really for months now. The private sector is uh, very modestly declining liquidity. The um, global FX reserves are very modestly building liquidity. Um, but when you kind of aggregate all that, that, that sum here, we find that, again, blue line here, the US, uh, the 42 macro global liquidity proxy, uh, red line is global equity market cap here. For the past four or five months, we've had a negative liquidity impulse. And you and I talking about this in, in late April, yep. we said liquidity is turning negative. And it's been negative since then. And this is why we've seen stocks diverge from crypto. Crypto has sucked wind since April, by and large, because <laughs> the liquidity situation is, has, um, has, um, has gone. And this is a very divergent view. There's folks out there, and you know, Michael Owls of the world, who does way better work on liquidity than we do. I think we do probably the second best work out there on liquidity, but mm -hmm. you know, you know, for folks, uh, folks, obviously I tip my cap to, to Michael Howell, but he and I are very different paths here. He sees, he continues to pound the table on liquidity's rising, liquidity's rising. Our model right. has shown liquidity been in a negative impulse in a negative state really since, uh, really since uh, the spring of this year. In our opinion, this is why the digital asset space has really sucked wind this year, despite the fact that we've seen, you know, kind of this big bull run higher in equities again, since we made that call in May. So this is interesting. So so I, I interviewed Michael probably not that long after I interviewed you, Darius. He's awesome, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, he's he, he he's great. And, and you know, his 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 liquidity thesis has had a lot of explanatory power this year as you know, yeah. stocks powered higher after a terrible year last year when everything looked really dark. Um, you guys both seem to have said that, yeah, at the end of Q4, there was a big net increase in liquidity and that's probably what what yanked the s p out of its doldrums in late october and gave us at least the first surge in the markets this year what's interesting though like you said and i haven't talked to michael recently so so i could be wrong here but um but it sounds like you said he still says liquidity is increasing so what is it about his model and your model that is different in measuring liquidity in the second half of this year couldn't tell you. I have no idea what makes this model. I'm sure it's got a lot more factors in our model. As I mentioned, we are global central bank balance sheet plus global broad money supply plus global FX reserves minus gold. This model has a 0.97% R squared with the S&P since going back to the beginning of 2009. So <laughs> I don't know what's in his model. I respect his work a tremendous amount. I've learned a lot from him uh, over the years as an investor and, and hold him in, in, in the highest regard. Um, but again, it's okay to have divergent views when you have divergent research processes. And guess sure. what? We're our own researcher here at 42 Macro. And guess what? That model's been right. We've been right on this discussion, this debate. Bitcoin peaked the day we said, so cut your Bitcoin position to have their minimum in mid-April when we saw this analysis uh, saw it said that the liquidity impulse uh, was turning negative. And, and I think you sort of asked sort of why has it diverged from stocks? Well, the reason it's diverged from stocks is because liquidity is not the only thing that matters to the equity market. You know, one of the things we keep a track on on a daily basis in our lead up morning note, of, amongst many things in terms of our quantitative risk management signals, is this sort of multi-factor correlation study to actually identify what's actually driving markets. Right now, and what we know is what's driving markets on a trend basis. The the the, fee, the macro feature that's driving the S and P right now are cyclical growth expectations, as proxied by front month copper futures. Well, what's driving Bitcoin on a trend basis? Bitcoin, particularly lower on a trend basis, is the rise in the terminal Fed funds rate, the rise in the floor Fed funds rate, and the rise in the real ten year tip shield as proxy uh, structural growth expectations as proxy by the real ten year tip shield. So you have to understand what actually is driving these markets. To ultimately forecast where they're headed. And, and obviously you need to remain Bayesian throughout that entire process when you have positions on to understand how this stuff is evolving and how it's changing and ultimately how those changes need to kind of cause you to do something different from a portfolio construction standpoint. So again, these are all models that we refresh on a daily basis, six times a week at 42 Macro in terms of our lead off morning note and our round the horn. And then sometimes seven times a week when we put out our monthly macro scouting report presentation. So to answer your question, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Michael and other investors out in the world, but I really don't care <laughs> what they what their models say. I, I care what our models say, and ultimately, because that's what we're going to be communicating uh, to our clients around the world. Right. Great. Well, fantastic. Fascinating. I've just wrote myself a note here to schedule, uh, reach out to Michael to see if he'll come back on so we can get an update from him to see what he has to say. That last chart you just had on those correlations. Those are statistical correlations, right? Are you yeah. are you running regressions to get those correlations? Yeah, these are these are daily log price change correlations. Between God, I, I just love the fact that you're that steeped in the data. That is really <laughs> cool to be able to see that. Yeah, no, of course, man. Again, we keep, we keep this model up uh, daily. Like right now, like we understand that, hey, look, 
when the cyclical growth expectation tide turns, when the market really starts to get concerned about growth, you're assuming this the state this condition stays the same, you're going to have problems in the equity market. Uh, right, you know, well, we go we go back to that chart you were showing earlier that that basically showed the the rosy um, analyst expectations going out from here, mm, right? Yeah. You know, so you're basically you're saying is once those guys start saying, oh, wait a minute, maybe we're a little bit too enthusiastic, you know, that's going to impact the S and P because right now that's the biggest driving factor. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. This is why I still think we have right tail risk to price in in the equity market because I don't see that being growth being an issue between now and year end. Now, inflation between now and year might become a real big issue. Like right now, cyclical inflation expectations really have no correlation to the market uh, on a trend basis. Let's say this, you know, three months from now is now, a, a, you know, the dominant driver, let's say minus, I don't know, 30 percent or something like that. That means Brent crude oil has gone up a lot. The S&P has gone down a lot because inflation has wrestled the baton from cyclical growth expectations in determining the, you know, kind of the um, the direction of the equity market. But for now, as long as we still think the economy is resilient and our models going back to early part of the discussion suggest that the economy is likely to remain resilient for at least another three to six months, perhaps that's it. You know, you know, that's that's probably it, in my opinion. I think that's going to be it. Um, you know, but as long as it can remain resilient, at least until this year end dynamic, because again, Wall Street is behavioral just as much as it is economics and fundamentals and quantitative. Yep. You know, as these the Wall Street missed a rally, you know, the buy side missed a rally, and the closer you get to year end. The more they're going to have to participate in the rally if they want to, you know, kind of salvage, you know, some some semblance of performance for 2023 and ultimately support their careers. So again, I think there's a behavior dynamic in the market ahead of us. You know, I still think you know, we can you know, have some sort of a blow off top in equities, a blow off bottom in bonds <laughs> in terms of price uh, before we ultimately see those trends reverse on a structural basis. Okay, and and that that run to the end of the year um, that has been has been echoed very recently on this channel by several other experts here. Uh, there is. I, I just would, I, I'm sure you like hearing that because, as you said, you you, you like to deal with a preponderance of evidence. Yeah. So just know that there are others that are are, are making similar arguments, it, looking at maybe some similar, but probably other different uh, uh, bits of data or or doing different analyses. But can I ask you, you know, a quick question? What, what yeah. do you what would you say is their number one or what was the best argument for that particular outcome that you heard across the the various experts? Ah. Uh, Best argument, uh, hard to pick best, but but I'll, I'll tell you what what Sven Henrik, who again is the the technical analyst, and he, he said, look, this isn't even TA. He said it's just basic averages, but he took the um, the average performance of the S and P um, every year for the past twenty years and just came up with a composite, uh, and it, it so it basically shows you sort of average seasonality of the S and P. And he says, I, I don't normally like trade off of this, but he said if you look at how it has performed this year. It is the script that the markets have been following. Mm -hmm. He said, for better or worse, I, I just, I, I'm just shocked at how well this has actually uh, charted the arc of markets this year. And it shows generally, you know, on average, the past 20 years, you see kind of this, this, you know, pretty decent surge from October through December in the end of the year. So he's just basically saying, look, as long as this correlation holds, this is what we should expect going forward. Interesting, interesting. That's good analysis. It's gonna. I would personally pull it back a little further. In fact, we have analysis. I want to say, well, you, you'd pull it back to eighteen hundred. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we, yeah, we pull all of our uh, econometric analysis back as far back as we can. The data, particularly for that fourth turning study, uh, we pulled it back as um as as far as the back to eighteen hundred. Because once you start getting past eighteen hundred, you're going to run into some squirrely statistics. But the one thing I'll say on seasonality that is a little bit, um, not a little bit, a lot of bit you know, on the other side of um Sven's uh, view, which I'm not, I'm not even saying I disagree with it because I still think we're going to experience a a, a blow off top in the in the equity market, but. Our empirical analysis on seasonality says it actually tends to be quite poor in the second half of the year. And so we looked at, um, we took all the data in the S&P 500 that we have. We have data going back to 1928, um, at least I can, that's as far back as I can find the data in Bloomberg. And what we found is that when the equity market has an advance in the first half of the year, that's greater than or equal to the 16% advance that we experienced through June 30th of this year, you typically okay. have negative median returns in the equity market and negative in Q3 and negative throughout the entirety of the second half of the year. Now, there is a range of outcomes like there always is in any statistical analysis. So, you know, we could be making a new 100 percentile reading here. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, again, I don't trade with seasonality personally. I just need to know what other people think about seasonality. And it's right. thank you for sharing that about Sven, um, you know, in terms of his analysis. But again, our analysis, which is a little bit more robust in terms of the the, the, the time series that we study, it, it suggests that seasonality is actually quite poor 
you know, when you start the year off to, to quite a hot start, like what we started this year. Right. And, and I can't speak specifically for Spen, but my, my guess is, is he didn't have the filter you had here where you, you're, it looks like you're looking at the years that were mm. had a big first year rally, right? Which, yeah. which is really comparing apples to apples much more than just the past 20 years. Uh, so, you know, I, I can understand your logic here, um, but it'll be interesting to see. And again, all, all Spen was saying was, is just like it or not, this has been the path that's been following. So if that correlation holds, We'll and I don't disagree with it. I don't disagree yeah. with it. No. Um, all right. So last question, and then we'll wrap it up here. Um, so I, I mentioned there was an, a, a, an asset you had mentioned and an asset you didn't mention. The one you didn't mention was gold. Gold. And I'm just curious, in this sort of fourth turning you know, world where you expect pretty substantial both volatility, but also um, you know, real damaging of the, the purchasing power of, uh, of the currency, yeah, I totally get Bitcoin in that scenario. Would you include gold or is there a reason that you're not mentioning gold? Oh, no, sorry. I'm just, I'm a millennial. So I, <laughs> Bitcoin is gold for me. But yeah, maybe if I was a, yeah, I'm an old millennial. So like if I was like maybe two years older, I'd be a Gen X and I'd be talking yeah. about gold instead of if you had If you had a little more, you know, gray in your hair. Like some of <laughs> well, if I could grow a beard, it'd be gray. But the sides yeah. of my hair are gray. But <laughs> I can't grow a beard. So that's neither there. But uh, yes, in my head, gold and Bitcoin are the same thing. Gold, Bitcoin is high vol gold, in my opinion. And these okay. Certain, how it's historically traded, at least in, in recent years, hasn't always traded that way, you know, in kind of the infancy of Bitcoin. But really, since it became a, I wouldn't say institutional asset class, but kind of an asset class that we've all participated in to varying degrees, really since 2018, 2019, 2020. It's traded very much in lockstep with gold, um, obviously with a lot more volatility. So think about it, it transpose everything I said about Bitcoin being a very positive asset longer term, but probably has to go through not one, but two problem sets. One, the recession that's likely to commence next year. Uh, and two, the, the longer term problem set of structurally elevated inflation, ultimately causing a problem in the treasury market that the Fed has to fix. It's the fixing the problem that causes gold, Bitcoin, stocks to go asymptotic, but we I'll actually take experience the problem first. And again, this is why we said the fourth turning challenge is, is going to be, the fourth turning crisis is going to want to be the biggest challenges we ever face as investors, because we're talking about some severe ups and downs, very volatile you know, just, you know, explosive moves in our portfolios. And if you're not positioned with good timing and good risk management to deal with that throughout the entire process, you will struggle as an investor to handle this because we're talking about some of the highest volatility in economic statistics that you're ever going to experience in your life and some of the highest volatility in financial market outcomes that you're going to experience as a result of that. Okay. So um, you're in great company when I interviewed Felix Zuloff at the beginning of this year. He looked out at the next decade and he called it the decade of the roller coasters mm -hmm. and said, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be very much like this. And it's going to be largely kind of lurching from policy change to policy change, you know, in response to a, a lot of the instability and, and um, you know, ups and downs that you're talking about um, being in company with Felix Zuloff is always a really great place to be. I, I was just about to say, thank you for saying <laughs> that, because I feel like there is like a list of people who I like very much value the research and I would put Michael Howell in this, in this, in this short list of people, which is when they say something, if I disagree with what they're saying, I need to be damn sure that my research is correct, right? Like the level, the right. threshold that I have to publishing something, putting something in front of our clients, if I'm on the wrong side of a guy like Michael Howell, a guy like Felix Zuloff, or a woman like Juliette DeClerc, you know, you know, like those types of people, I'm like, I need to make sure I'm right. So I have a lot of respect for those types of investors. And so I'm, I'm glad to be in good company there. All right, great. Well, so what he was saying, which is I think I hear you saying the same thing, which is, look, uh, we've gotten spoiled, lulled into complacency, whatever, by the era that we've come out of, uh, coming out of the global financial crisis where we had QE one through you know infinity, and um, just uh, you know going long, buying the dip was all pretty darn easy. Sounds like you're saying, look, those those days of a nice, easy, passive ride are over. And active management is going to be much more important going forward. And risk management is going to be really important going forward because there's going to be some great, I'm putting words in your mouth, so feel free to, to, to change them, but there's going to be some great opportunities uh, to have some, some tremendous return potential here, but you got to not get wiped out to 100%. be able to play those. Million percent. That's If they take away one thing from this two-hour discussion, Adam, it's you need to have proper risk management systems in place to make sure you don't get wiped out from the success of volatility that we're likely to experience. Now, again, it's not all bad. You hear the word volatility as investors, particularly retail investors, they think bad. But volatility can be very good for you if you think about Bitcoin or the NASDAQ in the 90s to the upside. 
And that's what we're effectively arguing. It's just that the path to getting to that is going to be extremely volatile and extremely fraught. And there'll be a lot of dead bodies, both institutional and retail, who folks who just trade the cycles wrong. And ultimately, you're going to have to, I would say, hire someone like me or hire someone who you think is better than me to help you you know, risk manage that process. Is Because if you're a retail investor or an RA investor without not a lot of resources, you will struggle in this decade. All right. So I'm going to say you need a, you need great intelligence and you need a great team. Uh, so I'm going to let you talk about the intelligence part first. So uh, Darius, for folks that have really enjoyed this discussion, would like to learn more about you, follow you in your work, where should they go? I appreciate it, man. This I love connecting with you, Adam. You, you're one of the most prepared interviewers I've ever experienced in my life, man. And it obviously comes back from your, your institutional finance background. So I just want to say thank you for having me again on your platform. We're obviously do this again and, uh, and provide an update at the proper time. Uh, but, you're uh, more folks, than welcome. It is a true joy, brother. So don't I, worry. <laughs> I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. So uh, for those who you know kind of like what we're here doing, and again, as I mentioned, all this research is very Bayesian. We do the same things every day. We update the same models and presentations on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis here at 42 Macro. Come check us out. 42 macro.com. Um, you know, my Twitter is Darius Dale 42. That's my full name. Uh, uh, 42 is my, my Twitter handle. Uh, we try to put a lot of educational content out there on the, on the, on the Twitter sphere. But the reality is we, re we rarely talk about portfolio construction and asset allocation beyond our paywall. That's reserved for our paying clients, folks who want to support our business. I'm a, you know, African-American man in a country where a lot of us don't have businesses. I grew up very poor in this country. So, you know, I want to say that I'm very grateful to be here and have an opportunity to connect with this platform and, and your audience. And I just want to say, come check us out. You don't have to subscribe, but definitely come check us out, 42macro.com. All right, great. And Darius, when we edit this, we'll put up both the links to your Twitter handle and to your website there on the screen so folks know exactly where to go. Folks will also be links in the description below too. So it should be real clear how to go follow Darius. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say, uh, you know, I, I, I say this on every video, um, but I think Darius, you just really helped me drive the point home, which is, you know, most people... Uh, especially a lot of people watching this video, but just most people out there, um, uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the different permutations of what could happen here. Um, it They have real lives, right? They, they've got families to take care of. They've got jobs to get a focus on. They don't have the ability to watch the markets as closely as you do and, and be able to, to pivot when conditions change, just like you pivoted after you were on the channel the last time that we spoke, right? Um, so highly recommend that folks work with a good professional financial advisor who takes into account all of the issues uh, and the data that, that uh, Darius and I talked about here. And I'll tell you, there aren't that many on a percentage basis that do this. So many of them have been conditioned by the ease of the past couple of decades that they just say, ah, oh, you know what, just stocks for the long haul, just remain fully invested. The market's going to take care of you, right? And in the type of environment that Darius and I were just talking about, that can be a recipe for destruction uh, where you get wiped out before you get a chance to be right. So um, highly recommend you work with a, a really good financial advisor to do that. If you've got it, one who's doing it, great, stick with them. Like I said, they're rare. If you don't, or you'd like a second opinion from what it does, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Only takes a couple of seconds to do that. These consultations are totally free. Um, there's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service they offer. A great compliment to subscribing to Darius's revenue, uh, Darius's service, getting great intelligence, and then getting a, a, an advisory partner to say, "Great, how do I put this into action in my own portfolio, given my own personal needs, goals, risk tolerance, etc." Um, let's. Uh, I'm going to hand the baton back to you here, Darius, because you've got something interesting to talk about here. It looks like. No, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt or hijack. That, that was a great uh, a plug. I, I definitely agree with everything you just said. The one thing I'll say is you, you sort of mentioned one thing. We put together this information to talk to the, the most sophisticated institutions in the world. We just happen to sell it to retail investors and RA investors. You know, the, we seem to have a very loyal, passionate fan base of folks who want this information and want to challenge themselves to learn about the economy and financial market cycles. But the reality is, if you don't want to do that, or if you don't have time to do that, you will never, ever, from 42 macro research, ever have more than five positions to risk manage. Our KISS portfolio construction process is a 60-30-10 approach that's designed to take equities, fixed income, and macro asset classes based on the regime that we're in and ultimately help you manage that you know, through you know, flexing your liquidity, flexing your cash position. So at 100% at of the time, you will never have to worry about, oh my God, well, he said this, so how do I do this? Or he said this, so how do I do this? 
very specific risk management, very specific uh, position sizes and allocations and portfolio construction guidance from us. And it's never going to have more securities on this page than we um, currently have right here. So uh, I just want to say we do simplify everything we just said uh, for the, you know, for retail investors who may be early uh, in that learning journey. I love that. Yep. If you are, uh, you know, DIY, want to do it yourself, want to, but stand on the shoulders of, you know, a great expert who's doing all this. This looks like a fantastic resource for that. And again, to get access to this, they just go to 42 Macro. It's part of a subscription there. Absolutely. 42macro.com. It's part of all of our subscriptions, uh, but we primarily focus on the uh, portfolio construction updates in our Around the Horn subscription. Uh, but obviously, a lot of the information that is informing that from a systematic standpoint, it's coming through uh, each of our subscriptions. So our lead up morning note and our macro scouting report, what we just went, the presentation we went through today uh, was our macro scouting report uh, with some supplemented charts from our lead up morning note this morning. All right. Fantastic. Um, well, look, uh, Darius, uh, it's, I see here it's been two full hours. Thank you for giving us so much time. Uh, it went uh, in a flash, which is the sign of a great interview. Um, folks, if you'd like to have Darius come back on this channel again, particularly when his models start telling us that you know there's a new update to his outlook, um, please encourage him to do that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, Darius, again, as always, such a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on, buddy. Um, I'll let you have the last word here. No, Adam, you're, you're a wonderful man. I just want to say thank you for all that you do for our community. Uh, I just want to say thank you for having me on. And I just want to say thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, you know, so we, we take for granted us talking heads you know, the audience that we build, but you know, we have to earn that audience daily. And I just want to say thank you for everyone who, you know, continues to allow me and Adam and all of us to continue to earn your trust uh, daily because that's what we're what we're trying to do. Appreciate uh, you. I can't say it better myself. All right. Thanks so much, Darius. Really appreciate it, brother. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.